Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Start rolling. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Texas Public Radio Town Hall meeting on KSTX 89.1 FM. I'm Texas Public Radio's News Director, David Martin Davies. Tonight, we're turning our attention to the 1965 Voting Rights Act, a law that, after being passed almost 50 years ago, is again controversial. We're looking forward to a civil discussion about the topic. Please, no outburst from the, uh, from the audience. And we are recording this program for broadcast on KSTX. And we are being broadcast live on the internet on nowcastsa.com. Online viewers are invited to participate. You can send in questions via Twitter. The hashtag is KSTX Town Hall. We also have mics for the audience so they can come up and ask questions and offer comments about the Voting Rights Act. So here's a rundown of how things work. I'm going to introduce our five panelists, and then we're going to listen to a radio feature about the history and the present challenges to the Voting Rights Act. And then we'll uh, go down the line to get comments from our panelists, and we'll open up to the audience. So let's get started. Here's our panelist. Um, going from my right to my left, um, we have Henry Flores. He's a professor of political science and the dean of the graduate school at St. Mary's University since 19. 86, Dr. Flores has served as an expert witness in more than 50 federal voting and civil rights lawsuits. Next to him, we have Gilbert Garcia. He's a political reporter with 16 years experience reporting throughout the Southwest. He's written extensively about the redistricting debate and the voter ID law. He currently writes for the online newspaper, Plaza de Armas. He's recently published the book, Reagan's Comeback. And here to my right, Immediately, uh, we have State Representative Trey Martinez Fisher. Martinez Fisher is currently in his sixth term representing District 116. The San Antonio Democrat is also currently chairman of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus. The caucus is one of the most visible opponents to the Republican led legislature's congressional <coughs> district maps. And here, immediately to my left, or where time for you to be on the left, uh, George. Um, <laughs> I have uh, George Rodriguez. He's the uh, president of the San Antonio Tea Party. Rodriguez and the San Antonio Tea Party are a vocal supporters of both the maps drawn by the Republican-led legislature and the Texas voter ID law. The Tea Party is also critical of the Voting Rights Act. And all the way to the end here, we have Trey Trainer. He's an Austin-based attorney specializing in election law and government relations, a former general counsel to the Texas Secretary of State. Trainer advises numerous elected officials and political organizations on compliance with state and federal election regulations. He has been intimately involved in Texas redistricting. We also did invite the uh, Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott to participate, or someone from his office. Uh, they declined. Now, the <clears throat> Voting Rights Act didn't just pop up in Congress one day in 1965 and get passed. This landmark civil rights legislation was the culmination of a long struggle. We're now going to listen to a report about how the Voting Rights Act came to be. On a Sunday, March 1965, that about 600 civil rights activists marching for it was on a Sunday, March 1965, that about 600 civil rights activists marching for equal access to the ballot box were heading east out of Selma, Alabama, on U.S. Highway 80. When they got to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they found a wall of state troopers waiting for them. It'll be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly. You have to disperse. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. Is that clear to you? I've got nothing further to say to you. The marchers did not disperse and the troopers, with their newly deputized recruits, charged, pushing the peaceful activists back up the street and then to the ground. Troopers rode in on horseback into the crowd. Tear gas was fired at the protesters, and the authorities began beating the activists with their state-issued batons, chasing them back into Selma. The confrontation was captured by a national news crew, and the images were featured on the nightly network news. Soon, the Reverend Martin Luther King would be in Selma, calling for calm, but also demanding change. We are going to walk nonviolent. 
silently and peacefully to let the nation and the world know we are tired now. We've lived with slavery and segregation 345 years. We waited a long time for freedom. We are trying to remind the nation of the urgency of the moment. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time. It was days later that President Lyndon Johnson would cite this atrocity on the Edmund Pettus Bridge when he addressed a joint session of Congress. There, long-suffering men and women peacefully protested the denial of their rights as Americans. Many were brutally assaulted. One good man, a man of God, was killed. There is no cause for pride in what has happened in Selma. There is no cause for self-satisfaction in the long denial of equal rights of millions of Americans. But there is cause for hope and for faith in our democracy and what is happening here tonight. He called for a new law to protect voting rights. The result was the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It gave the federal government the teeth it needed to enforce the 15th Amendment. Passed in 1870 after the Civil War, it prohibited the government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on that citizen's race or color. The Voting Rights Act was signed into law by LBJ on August 6, 1965. There were those who said smaller and more gradual measures should be tried. But they had been tried. For years and years, they had been tried and tried and tried, and they had failed and failed and failed. And the time for failure is gone. There were those who said that this is a many-sided and very complex problem. But however viewed, the denial of the right to vote is still a deadly wrong. And the time for injustice has gone. President Johnson knew him. he would have a very difficult time getting it through Congress. But the bloody events of, in Selma, Alabama, gave impetus to President Johnson to push congressmen to, uh, to pass that law. Mark K. Updegrove is the director of the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library in Austin. I don't think there's any single law that he passed in his prodigious legislative uh, career as, as president that matches the Voting Rights Act. And I would think, I would say that he would be most proud of the Voting Rights Act because passing the Voting Rights Act gave African American people and people of all colors uh, in, this, in this country a real voice in the electorate. And giving them that voice gave them real political power and leverage. Since 1965, the Voting Rights Act has been used by the federal courts and the Justice Department in a number of ways, including reviewing redistricting. Federal judges are looking to see if the new maps were drawn with the intent to sap away minority voting strength. And questions are being raised about the current redistricting maps in Texas, and that's what's held up our state primaries. And the Voting Rights Act is also being used to reject the Texas voter ID law, which was passed in the last legislative session and signed by Governor Rick Perry. And this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. I think uh, any uh, person who uh, does not want to see uh, fraud uh, believes in having good, open, honest elections, transparent. And one of the ways to do that, one of the best ways to do that, is to have a identification, a photo identification, so that you prove you are who you are. Perry was recently on Fox News and explained the state's position in challenging the Voting Rights Act. Here we are in, in 2012, and the idea that uh, somehow or another uh, the southern states, and Texas in particular, uh, a state that is a majority minority uh, in our public schools now, uh, is somehow or another being discriminatory towards minorities, I think is a, a vestige of, of fear tactics that have been used through the years that, that frankly, uh, don't hold water anymore. Opponents of the voter ID law say it discriminates against minorities. 
the U.S. Justice Department found that the law disproportionately disenfranchises registered minority voters. Hispanics disproportionately lack either a driver's license or a personal identification card, and that disparity is significant. As part of his defense of the voter ID law, Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott has filed a court challenge to the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. He says it violates state sovereignty. The challenge is likely headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And what would President Johnson think today of his signature law still being fought against? Up to Grove says he's sure LBJ wouldn't like it. My guess is that President Johnson would be disconsolate over the fact that that the crown jewel of his legislative accomplishments was being challenged by various states throughout the country. Uh, and he would urge for a reasoned approach to, to voting rights. As he always said, come let us reason together, and I think he would want reason to prevail in this case as well. And that's what we're doing here today. We're going to reason together about the Voting Rights Act. This is KSTX, the town hall meeting on the Voting Rights Act. You can follow us on Twitter, the hashtag is KSTX Town Hall. Now let's turn to our panelists for their take on the present state of the Voting Rights Act, and we'll give you about five minutes, uh, and we'll begin with Dr. Flores. Uh, how is the Voting Rights Act used uh, in redistricting? If we didn't have a Voting Rights Act, how would uh, things be different in, in Texas for minority voters? Well, S Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act requires um, several jurisdictions, there are seven states and a broad array of other sub-jurisdictions, townships, counties, parishes, depending on the state you're, that you're speaking of, that where there has been a finding made to Congress that a history of disgracial discrimination exists in that, those particular jurisdictions. Um, and Section 5 requires that any one of those jurisdictions, uh, they're called covered jurisdictions because they're covered by the law, that any one of the covered jurisdictions, um, when they make or propose a change to any part of their election structure or system or processes or laws must send that change to either the Department of Justice, Division of Civil Rights, and the Voting Rights section for pre-clearance. And that section makes a determination to decide whether or not the change will negatively impact the minority group that's covered by the law in that particular state. The other option is that Instead of appealing to the Department of Justice, the jurisdiction can send it to the um, District Court of um, Washington, D.C., and ask for um, uh, the court to, do, to make the same sort of uh, recommendation on, on the proposed change. Um, without Section 5, the jurisdictions that have a history of racial discrimination could change any kind of election law that they wanted to. They could move polling places, uh, arbitrarily, discriminatorily. Uh, for instance, um, in early polling places uh, in Bear County, uh, a number of years ago, um, the county decided that it was not cost effective to have the um, early voting place at uh, the Barbara Jordan Center on the east side of San Antonio uh, because there weren't, weren't, very, weren't very many people uh, casting ballots over there during the early voting process. Um, Somebody called the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and the attorney uh, uh, for voting rights attorney there called Bear County and says, "You cannot shut that voting poll place down because you didn't pre-clear it with the Department of Justice." So even the this, the smallest change, the county argued, "We're going to save money," and, and said, "Saving money is not part of the law. Saving money weighs less in the balance in the balances of justice." to the rights of the voters, and uh, which must be protected under the law. And, and so Bear County just, you know, they kept the, the polling place open. And as far as I know, it still is open for early, early voting. So that's just a, a brief example of, um, of one, what the, what the law covers, and, and, and two, what it would be like if it didn't. In redistricting, um, any jurisdiction, a school district, the, the city of San Antonio, um, the state of Texas, has to submit the redistricting plan um, that occurs, that, 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 that they do every, every 10 years, to DOJ or to the D.C. court for preclearance. And they have to look at those districts to see if um, there's any retrogression involved. In other words, uh, 
any advances made by uh, Hispanics or African Americans or Asian Americans that occur because of the of the of the of their of their the, the protection of the Voting Rights Act, if they if they if that change regresses their position and they go backwards because of that change, then it won't be approved. So that section section five is is really kind of a, a preventive kind of measure that 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 protects the rights of, of Latinos and, and blacks and, and Asians in, in the state of Texas. Okay. Um, Mr. Garcia, Gil Garcia, how has the public dialogue changed recently about talking about the Voting Rights Act? It seems that it wasn't that long ago that a politician really wouldn't have openly challenged it. it would, there had been some stigma involved. And um, state Republican leaders have charged that Attorney General Eric Holder is extra tough on Texas in enforcing the Voting Rights Act. H have we seen any evidence that, uh, of that at all? No, I don't think we've seen that. But, you know, I think this, this has been building for a while. I mean, they're in the early 80s. Basically, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was an emergency provision that was included because, uh, you know, we had the southern states had this history of discrimination. And the original idea was that it was going to be in place for five years and then it would come up for uh, renewal. And it's been renewed uh, four times uh, since then. And I think uh, when it came up in 1982 for a 25-year extension, uh, there was some some private uh, uh, there were some questions in the Reagan administration about this. I mean, they they had some doubts about whether this thing should be uh, uh, extended. So it, it's it's been going on, but I think the dial the the intensity uh, and the volume has uh, we've seen it uh, increase in recent years. And I think what what I, I think it's fair to have a discussion about the question of whether something that was an emergency provision, and it, a, a tremendously effective one, by the way, because when it came into, uh, into play in 1965, the uh, uh, state of Mississippi had 7% African-American voter registration, and within two years, it was up to 60%. So that was, a, it was an amazing accomplishment. The que I think there's a, a fair uh, debate to be had on whether this is uh, Section 5 is something that we will want to have permanently, whether this is whether these nine states are going to be subjected to different sets of rules from the other states. And I think when it comes to voter ID, um, I think the strongest argument that people have uh, in, in opposition to Section 5 is to say, well, you know, what, we've got a few states who are being uh, scrutinized on voter ID, and then other states have voter ID laws, and they're not being scrutinized on it. But the thing that stands out to me is that the, the people who are opposed to Section 5, to, to continuing it, and the people who want to see it go away, are generally the same people who uh, support voter ID. And when they oppose Section 5, the argument that, that's generally made is, this is a remedy for a problem that no longer exists. We're, this is a remedy for a problem that went away. That's Texas, that's ancient history, and uh, Texas has, has uh, and the southern states no longer have this, this, this pattern of discrimination. And it seems to me that, that you could make a very good argument with voter ID that it is a remedy for a problem that has not been proven to exist. Um, we, we have no solid evidence that, there, that we have uh, widespread examples of people going to election sites uh, with someone else's voter registration card and trying to, to cast a fraudulent vote. And uh, so I think that, that the part of the problem is that a lot of time and energy and expense has gone into this voter ID, uh, these voter ID laws, um, and the same argument that I think opponents of Section 5 would make could very easily be made uh, against voter ID. Thank you. Representative Martinez Fisher, uh, about the voter ID law, we frequently hear that having a photo ID is needed for cashing a check or even buying Sudafed. Why should voting be held to a lower standard than just you know, buying uh, Sudafed? And would you support the voter ID law if the state put the necessary resources into a program that would provide photo IDs to anyone who wanted one? That's a really good question. Uh, first, you know, let me thank you, David, for bringing this together and, and uh, like to thank Texas Public Radio for uh, bringing an important issue to the forefront and thank you to Trinity University's uh, Department of Political Science for sponsoring. Uh, you know, they, they say uh, campaign after campaign, they're probably saying it somewhere tonight in Illinois, that every vote counts. You hear that all the time, that these elections come down to every single vote. Every vote matters, and we should get people to vote. I want to tell you a story about a woman named Thelma Mitchell. Now, Thelma Mitchell is 93 years old. 
She cleaned offices in the state capitol in Nashville, Tennessee for 30 years. And while she worked in the capitol in Nashville, Tennessee for 30 years, she had an ID with her picture on it. Thelma cannot use that ID today in the state of Tennessee to vote. And because she was born by a midwife uh, in 1918, she doesn't have a birth certificate. And the state of Tennessee will not provide a means for her to obtain a certificate to prove who she is. And it didn't matter for 30 years when she was in and out of members of the House and members of the Senate in the state of Tennessee, cleaning their offices, taking out their trash, uh, cleaning up after their mess. Nobody seemed to care that she was who she was when she was sweeping the room. But all of a sudden, now she cannot vote. And the problem is, is that buying Sudafed, getting on a plane, uh, buying a pack of cigarettes, those aren't constitutional rights. But the right to vote is. And while the government certainly has a role in regulating and legislating and coming up with reasonable ways to make sure that you are of age to buy a pack of cigarettes and that you are of age to buy alcohol and that you can buy Sudo Sudafed without running a methamphetamine lab. Uh, but why should the government step in the shoes of censor and decide who gets to enforce their constitutional rights and who doesn't, especially in Thelma's instance, uh, where she did nothing wrong? Uh, she was born at a time where things were very different, uh, particularly in the South, and there are many people like her. And so if every vote truly matters, and if it's important, and if, it, and if we mean what we say when we say that, then when we legislate these issues, we don't create solutions in search of problems. We identify the problem and we fix it. We all know, everybody in this room that studies this issue knows that the real fraud in voting may exist with respect to mail-in ballots and how they are applied for and how they are channeled in the postal system and how they're voted and accounted for. This legislation does nothing to even address that issue. Uh, why don't we focus on that and let's take it one piece at a time and if we are going to engage in a debate and discussion about having an ID uh, to do more than get on a plane, let's do it in a way that is fair. Uh, here in San Antonio, we have three Department of Public Safety offices. None of them are open after five. None of them are open on weekends. You won't find one downtown, and you won't find one west of downtown. And so is it fair to the people that live in those communities uh, that they have to miss work? Uh, if they don't have a driver's license, my sense is many of them are not driving uh, and have to travel from far west San Antonio to the southeast side to get a driver's license. I think we can do a better job. Uh, this is not the idea. This is not the solution. There's certainly not been a problem. Uh, and I would care about the rights, the constitutional rights of Thelma Mitchell before I would uh, chase something that doesn't exist. Mr. Rodriguez, as the president of the uh, San Antonio Tea Party, um, you've said that uh, the Voting Rights Act is no longer needed. So are, are you confident that minority voters are not targets for voter suppression by the states? And uh, how do you see the Voting Rights Act is, as a vi violation of states' rights? I see this uh, situation that we're facing in Texas as one where it's not about, a, it's not about race and ethnicity, it's about a party. Uh, Hispanics, just because you're a Hispanic does not mean that you're a Democrat. And Democrats uh, have even criticized uh, Henry Cuellar for ne negotiating with uh, the Attorney General. Uh, they were upset that, um, they're, they're more upset about party losses than they are about uh, the Hispanic political diversity. The fact of the matter is that there is Hispanic political diversity. And um, probably someone like myself who is a conservative uh, and bilingual and bicultural is probably one of the uh, nightmares for some of these folks. The, um, the Democrats shouldn't blame, uh, should, should, uh, should not blame uh, racism at this point. They should be blaming the fact that they don't that they have a race-based message that, that can't attract a diversity of voters, and so therefore they can't uh, win certain elections. Uh, Naleo has has done uh, a uh, uh, extensive uh, research, and the, it shows that the figures show that there are more than uh, over a hundred uh, local um, Hispanic Hispanic elected officials in the in, in the state of Texas. So uh, I have to ask myself, well, where, where is the, this discrimination that's, that's prevalent and awful that, uh, that's going on right now? 
The fact of the matter is that there is political diversity in the Hispanic community now. There are Hispanic Republicans, there are Hispanic conservatives, there's even Hispanic Tea Party members. So the issue is not that we should continue punishing a state for the sins of individuals 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, and that it's time to move on. At what, at what time do you, does it quit being a tat nanny state that you handle and coddle and push along? At what point do uh, people stop uh, uh, pretending that, uh, that racism is like the boogeyman to scare people to come to vote? It's really, really time to stop it. The other issue is that uh, we can see it very, very clearly when, um, when individuals, uh, when Hispanics are marrying, intermarrying with Anglos and with African Americans at a high rate, well, it's called integration, folks. It's called integration. And uh, that should be something that we should be happy with. We should not be balkanizing America any further. Uh, I do oppose it. And I feel that it is really, really uh, uh, a problem. Uh, this, is a, this law addressed a problem in the past, but to continue pushing it and to continue supporting it at this point, I think it's really, really, all it is is discriminating against the state of Texas and discriminating against Americans just because they are not a certain ethnicity or race. You are discriminating against them. And that's the bottom line. Mr. Trainer, you've been on the inside in Austin during redistricting conferences. There, there's nothing wrong with redistricting to benefit one party over another, but how do you guard against drawing lines that hurt minority-dominated communities? Well, uh, I think when you, when you look at the Voting Rights Act in the context of redistricting, um, and, and we've started this entire conversation off talking about race, but if you read the Voting Rights Act, it's actually written as a race-neutral mm -hmm. uh, piece of legislation. It has no one particular race in mind. And what has happened is, uh, as time has gone on, it's been the politicization of the Voting Rights Act that's caused the problems and now leads to the call uh, to do away with the Voting Rights Act. And so sitting on the inside, drawing maps in a redistricting process, while Dr. King, in the clip that we just heard, talked about the fact uh, and, and often spoke about the fact that we should achieve a colorblind society. Uh, the first thing that happens in the redistricting process is that you go through and you identify what are majority minority uh, districts. You go through and identify the Hispanic districts. You go through and identify um, the black districts. And you see what the benchmark is for those. And you make sure that you hit those benchmarks again. So if you have an increase in population in the Hispanic community, like we've seen in the state of Texas, the Voting Rights Act actually forces us to pack them into districts to achieve the same numbers that uh, are under old census lines, uh, instead of looking at and saying, what are the real communities of interest here? How many representatives do these particular areas need? What are the important issues uh, for the state that need to be addressed? And those are the things that should be taken into consideration more importantly than race. But because of the Voting Rights Act, the very first question that's asked is, let's look at race. And I don't think that's what the intent of Dr. King and the marchers in Selma was, was to say, let's look at race first. I think what they were trying to march for and what the civil rights movement was about was, let's all be equal and let's all be on a level playing field. And while the Voting Rights Act, and particularly Section 5, attempted to achieve that early on, I think we've outlived its usefulness because it's now become a political tool. And I think you can see that in a lot of different cases. Most notably, I think you can see it uh, in Philadelphia when the new Black Panther Party has two uh, men dressed in all black with black braids on, holding batons outside of a polling location, denying people the right to go in and vote. And the Justice Department comes in and says, that's wrong and we're going to prosecute them for it under the Bush administration. And as soon as the Obama administration comes in, they drop the case. Or when you have places like Knoxby County, Mississippi, where Ike Brown ran an entire operation that, had to, uh, that revolved around uh, mail-in ballot fraud. And the Justice Department goes in several times, investigates, and they never find anything wrong. 
until finally the Attorney General of the state of Mississippi decides to prosecute Ike Brown and he pleads guilty. Same thing happens in Hale County and Perry County, Alabama, where again, Justice Department sent in, uh, voter, uh, sent in observers over and over again, never found anything wrong. They had a change in administration in Alabama. The Alabama Attorney General prosecutes. You have three people who confess uh, and plead guilty. And then of course you have uh, the case in Georgia of Johnson versus Miller, where the federal district court actually chastises the Justice Department for actually colluding with plaintiffs in the case to affect a political outcome. And that's what Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act has turned into. It's turned into a political tool, and that's why it needs to be done away with. Okay, we're going to open this up now to the audience. If you have questions or comments, we invite you to step up to the microphone and, uh, and bring your questions up. I have a question that we received uh, through the email, and I'll bring it up right now. Um, Recently, when I applied for a passport, my Texas birth certificate was rejected because it was an abstract and not a certified copy as required by the State Department. I applied online to the Texas Department of State Health Service for a long form birth certificate. As part of the process, they required that I have my Texas driver's license uh, to prove who I was. No problem since I have a Texas driver's license, but what if I didn't have a Texas driver's license? Does that mean I can't get a certified copy of my birth certificate? More to the point, how could I get a Texas driver's license or ID to satisfy the Texas voter ID law without a certified copy of my birth certificate that I can't get without a driver's license? So it's sort of a catch-22 there for people trying to prove who they are. And so I will um, kick that uh, to you and um, Mr. Trainer about how does that work? Does sure. it become to, a, a barrier to people who want to exercise sure. their right to vote? Well, Senate Bill 14 has provisions in it, the voter ID law uh, that's at issue, has provisions in it for uh, free identifications to be provided, and, and they're not driver's license. If you show up and say, I need an ID, a picture ID issued by uh, the, uh, uh, the, the department to vote, uh, they'll give you an ID, and, that, and that's in the law. And the reason it's in the law is because that was what was required uh, in order to, to uh, meet the muster uh, that the Supreme Court set forth in the Indiana, the first case to make it to the Supreme Court, the Indiana voter ID law uh, was challenged in there. Uh, and more importantly, uh, when Georgia, a, the only state uh, that's had a, a, the issue litigated before the Supreme Court and the only Section 5 covered jurisdiction uh, there, the, jo the, the Georgia legislation, when it went up the first time, did not have the provision of free identification in it. And the Supreme Court found that to be a, a, uh, a poll tax. Uh, so the inclusion of a free ID actually eliminates uh, all of the concerns about uh, whether or not someone can or can't get. As, as long as you go in and hold out uh, that you're using the ID for voting, you have to be given the ID. And I think it's important to remember when we talk about voter ID, and we often hear this red herring, of, well, there's a concern about uh, mail-in uh, voter fraud, and that's where the real problem is. Well, federal law already requires that for the very first time that you vote uh, by mail, you actually have to include a copy of a photo identification with your registration to receive the ballot uh, the first time that you vote by mail. And so, actually, federal law has a requirement in place uh, that takes care of a lot of the identification requirements uh, going forward, now we can't obviously for people who were grandfathered on the rolls uh, to receive uh, mail-in ballots, uh, they're going to continue to receive. Representative Martinez Fisher, I mean, how, how does it look from your end, your other aisle, well, end I of mean, the aisle? I think from the beginning, and, and it really, I, I don't think, I mean, there's obviously this issue of how Democrats and Republicans feel about it, but let's just look at it from the voters' uh, perspective. Uh, the state of Texas declared winners and losers when they decided what forms of IDs they would accept and which forms they wouldn't. And so it's uh, perfectly acceptable to vote with a concealed handgun license. Uh, uh, I, you know, I'm curious uh, how many people have them. I, I have one, and I'm sure a few of you in the crowd do too, but not everyone does. Uh, but you cannot use a state-issued ID for state employees uh, that are issued by DPS, the same state agency that will be issuing out these free identifications to go and vote. Uh, we can use our driver's license or military ID, but we cannot use uh, a college ID. Uh, you know, we, we seem to forget that when we apply or register to vote, 
we have to identify ourselves by our social security and our driver's license number. Um, when those are screened at the Secretary of State's office, they look for matches and mismatches. And if there is a mismatch, guess what? When you go to vote, guess what you have to produce? An ID. And so we have a pretty sophisticated system already. Uh, and what we have in this law now is a series of setups to where if you show up and you vote a provisional ballot, the law says you have to come back and prove who you are within a couple of days or your vote's not going to count. Uh, how many of you have stood in line to go vote once? And how many of you are willing to go back a second time after you voted? And what I think is that when we talk about this in the abstract and the 30,000 foot view, it sounds really nice and rosy. But when we take it down to the, to the individual level and you look at somebody like my mother, I use my mother all the time because she was my campaign manager. She was a precinct chair and she's been voting in Glen Oaks Elementary ever since it's been an elementary school. My mother has Parkinson's, so she doesn't have a driver's license. Um, and with Parkinson's, she's definitely not going to go out and get a concealed handgun license. Uh, and she's not doing a lot of traveling these days, uh, so she doesn't have a passport. But she's been voting at Glen Oaks Elementary since it opened and was a voting site. And what do we do for people like her when she wants to vote? How do we tell her that it's okay, your vote is counted all of your life, but all of a sudden, because we've changed directions because of this illusion of a problem, we're going to make it problematic for you. Is it fair to my mom? It shouldn't. It certainly isn't. Is it fair for people like my mom? It certainly isn't. Was it even discussed in the formation of the legislation? Absolutely not. Uh, the reason why these IDs are free is because it was challenged on the floor of the House because it was determined that when the state would give out a free ID, lo and behold, our structure of government has decided that we are going to put highways on a credit card and pay it with bonds and use money to service those bonds and pay the debt service. Well, guess what? When you start giving away free IDs that are being counted on to make payments for road projects, you've all of a sudden violated several bond covenants with the companies that have lent you and businesses that have lent you this money to build these roads. All of a sudden, you have a big problem. And so Texas didn't fix this for the sake of accommodating the voters. They fixed this because they knew they had a violation of their public finance and their public debt agreements with people who build roads and toll roads and things like that. That's why it was fixed. Uh, and I can tell you that because I was in the debate. Uh, and so there is some advantage of being on the inside. As this goes forward to the Department of Justice, I mean, they will I immediately recognize that there are many people who are in this state that don't have IDs, don't have a pathway to get it, and there is no flexibility within the system to allow these people the ability to go out and vote. We have said, let's make voting fraud and voting, voter impersonation, let's make it a felony to send people to jail. Throw them under the jail. But let's make it easy for everybody who wants to vote, rejected very quickly on party lines. Okay, we have uh, some participants. You have a question, sir? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Randy Bear. I'm just a member of the community. Um, I appreciate Dr. Flores and Gilbert explaining Section 5 and why it was there. It was essentially, and what I've heard it referred to is it's a speed bump in those states that had um, past history. And I understand about the past history aspect, but it, I have, we have to go and go to the current day. And the interesting part I have to do is I have to kind of go back to, to, uh, Trey, uh, to Trey Trainer here on this. I look at uh, CD26 which the history on that is it's Tarrant County and it's Denton County. And the original map drawn by the, by the, um, the past legislature had, you, when you mentioned communities of interest, it was very interesting to see this finger of a district that extended into Tarrant County but had all of Denton County. And so it's hard to see the community of interest there, first of all, whenever, whenever the prior districts were really Fort Worth. So the legislature passed that without preclearance, that, that, that particular district would have been enacted. With preclearance, it stopped it and basically had a review. And uh, A.G. Abbott basically conceded, and the new district actually looks better. It has a, just a small part of the north of Tarrant County. So I have to ask you a question on this. When you talk about communities of interest and you talk about this no need for this thing, how do you reconcile that with the fact that we had a legislature that actually put a district in like that and actually we found out that that was not a good district? So that's where I'm at on it. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would challenge whether or not we had found out that it's a good district or not. What we have in place now is an interim uh, map. Uh, the, the case is still ongoing before uh, the district court in the District of Columbia that will make determinations as to whether or not uh, there was any t type of discriminatory intent involved. Um, the, the, the process of redistricting and the outcome of the way these districts looks uh, a lot of times is a function of geography and it's a function of uh, the requirement of the Constitution uh, to have uh, exactly equal population, particularly with regard to 
uh, congressional districts like you mentioned. So when you have to have the exact number of people uh, with no deviation whatsoever, you're going to end up with odd districts. Otherwise, we'd be able to take whole counties and put them together and we'd have deviations uh, a lot like the lines uh, in the house maps that look a lot cleaner. Uh, so it makes it very difficult when you have to, com when, when, you, uh, when you have to, and of course we all want to comply uh, with the 14th Amendment and make sure that everybody has one person, one vote uh, as the standard. Uh, but it, it forces those type of, of draws of districts where uh, you end up with odd configurations. And of course that happens throughout the map where you have little portions of counties and little portions of cities uh, that get severed off uh, to meet federal constitutional requirements. And I do want to remind our listeners that this is the te Texas Public Radio Town Hall meeting on the Voting Rights Act. And, and Gil, do you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think that if we look at the history of the state, I mean, there is gerrymandering has always occurred. I mean, we, Democrats were in power for a long time, and that it occurred there, and, and Republicans have been in power more recently, and, and it's occurred. And, but, you know, the, the, the bigger issue is, is there, you know, the, the intent to discriminate along racial or ethnic lines. And I think that the argument that Greg Abbott makes is that, that the, you know, Section 5 has done its job and we've, we've elected, uh, you know, African American and Latino uh, elected, elected officials over the last 40 some years and that we've, we've, we're past that. But I think that the, that the deeper question is, do we still need it as a deterrent? I mean, have we, have we achieved this uh, and is it no longer necessary? Is it have we have we have we changed so much that that there's no need for it anymore? Or are we? Is there that need for that deterrent to continue to to make sure that the state continues to follow those guidelines? And Dr. Flores, yeah, just to 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 expand on on, on what Gilbert was saying and as, and and to comment on a little bit on uh, on uh, Mr. Rodriguez's comment about Naleo's showing the increase in, in Latino elected officials. Naleo um, will actually tell you that the, that the increase of, of in Latino officials over the last, and they keep track every year, I get a directory of every Latino elected and appointed official in every state of the union uh, from Arturo uh, <laughs> Vargas. Uh, he says, with my compliments, Dr. Flores, so I keep them. So I've got this long database of going back, I don't know how many years of, of, of their data and it, it's a very clear line. It shows his increase. But he'll be the first one to tell you, and they've done research at Naleo to say, show this, that there's a direct result of this, this increase, is a direct result of the imposition of the Voting Rights Act and particularly Section 5. So it works to increase representation, for one. Now, the, the, the whole issue about fraud is very interesting. If you go, and I invite you to Google whenever you get home or whatever, Google the, the Brennan Center for, for Justice and look at their research that they've conducted on fraud, electoral fraud. And, and the three states that they've, that they've looked at, they've found incidences ranging from two ten thousandths of 1% to four ten thousandths of 1% occurrences of voter fraud. This whole issue about voter fraud is a red herring. You know, and I invite anybody who, who claims that, that, that uh, the voter ID laws or any other kind of provisions they want to put in place is to prevent voter fraud, to come up with a research to show how much voter fraud really is going on. Because I'll, I'll venture to say that there's, there's not as much as people are made, made, made to think there is. Okay, we have another question from the floor. Uh, hello, I'm Matthew Sheridan, a senior at the School of Science Technology. And um, I wanted to address a question to everybody, but I wanted to comment on Mr. Rodriguez's um, assessment about uh, what racism. I agree that there is tons of diversity in the Latino culture and we do have people that vote both conservative and liberal on issues. But I'd like to say that there are correlational studies that show that more Hispanic people tend to vote Democratic. And I would think that in a legislation that can look at that when drawing lines, they would know they could use that to an advantage to either gerrymander or put an advantage for them in re-election. So my main question is, um, why do we have the people who are responsible, or why do we have the people who are getting elected to power draw the lines that are gonna determine you know, who votes for them and puts them in power? Why don't we have some other organization or maybe some national uh, organization do this or go to a PR system? Okay, so he was addressing you, Mr. Rodriguez, you wanna respond? <clears throat> 
it seems to me that what you're asking is why not have a, um, a, a commission or a bureaucracy that would establish it. Which some states have. Yeah, and that's fine. That's fine, but I, I oppose that. I think that that, that runs contrary to what um, the, uh, the ideals of the Constitution and the Founding Fathers. So therefore, you know, I, I don't think that that's, that's something that we want to we wanna do. The idea is that a political party wins the votes based on what they are uh, preaching, promoting, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, from my point of view, that would be a disaster. That would be a disaster. Now, but can you elaborate? What's a disaster? A disaster. A disaster mm -hmm. is um, when people claim that they don't have. Uh, excuse me. Um, it is when people claim that there is no need for uh, voter identification, and there is. When people claim that 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 there there is no research, and the research being done is being done by people who promote. The idea of no of no the uh, no need for uh, for voter registration, I think that that's 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 the headache that I see, and um, what we've got right now is a, a situation where, uh, again, I insist that this is a political situation. This is not an issue related to race or ethnicity. This is a political situation where Democrats are upset that they have lost, and the reason that they have lost it's their own fault. It's not. It's not anybody. It's not anybody else's. I mean, they have they have put painted themselves into a corner uh, uh, in the message that they that they put forth, and um, uh, I am very very proud and happy that uh, the Tea Parties had something to do with promoting and pushing the uh, the the victories of so many Republicans, a Republican majority, into the uh, state Senate and into the state House for the first time in a long time, and thus. Um, you know, it was the vote. It was voters that said, "This is what we want." And uh, now, for the for for the Justice Department or for <coughs> the losing party to try to reverse that and try to say, "No, that's not fair." What's not fair? Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I think it's important to, you know, when, when you consider looking at whether or not you have a commission or some other mechanism in place, you know, the Texas Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government, uh, and, it's the, and the federal Constitution assigns the redistricting uh, obligation to the legislature. Now, the legislature can change that any time they want to. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, I think importantly, I think it would take a vote of the citizens of the state of Texas to change the Constitution to take that authority away from uh, the legislature to do it. And if you think it's going to be any better, I mean, you need you needn't look any further than Arizona to see what happened ju just recently with their adoption of a commission uh, and the back and forth. I mean, the, a, a commission can be just as partisan uh, as the legislature can be. And in some instances, it can be more partisan. At least when the legislature meets, they meet in public. Uh, they have an open public debate. Uh, Representative Martinez Fisher gets to, to express his views. Uh, the press is there, covers everything. It's very possible for uh, a small commission of five, six, eight people, however many you put on there, to, to collude together at any time. Uh, and then come out and, and have a public vote. So I think it's, it's a much more fair process when you have open public committee meetings. I know in 2003, I mean, there were busloads of people uh, during the congressional redistricting who were coming in from all over the state to address the, the uh, committee. The legislature has the resources. They went out and had hearings all over the state uh, for that. Uh, so, you know, I think there's much more public input into the process when you have the legislature involved. And uh, Senate... Republican Senator Jeff Wentworth of San Antonio has been pushing a plan that would create some sort of committee that would uh, right. change the way things are done, sort of like what this young man has suggested. Now, Representative Fisher, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I, I did. I, I think that uh, Georgia intrigued me here. That, that I mean, we, we try to position this, that this is just a fight between Republicans and Democrats, and I get that. That's easy. That's easy to sell. That's easy for people to understand because Republicans and Democrats are always going at it. But let's just look at the facts in the context of the Voting Rights Act. We're talking about a state that over the course of a decade grew by 4.2 million people in 10 years. That is huge. Uh, 3.7 million of those people were minority, and 2.7 million of those people were Latino. And when you look at this through the lenses of race and not politics, you will see what was the result of Texas growing 
so fast. In Congress, that meant four new seats. The last time that happened in the state of Texas, it was the 1860s. It was after the Civil War. It was during Reconstruction. Probably won't happen again in my lifetime, may not happen in my daughter's lifetime. This is significant. We grew four new seats because of that growth. And let's look at the scoreboard. When the legislature finished, that, that robust growth that we talked about resulted in zero net gains for minorities in Congress and minus six seats in the Texas House. How is that about politics? That's about race. And there's clearly an issue of people who try to mask themselves with race to get into the Voting Rights Act litigation because that's the only way they can save their political skins. But there are true litigation teams out there uh, that are looking at this through the lenses of minority groups. The NAACP, MALDEF, our caucus. We are the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus, and we are mostly comprised of Democrats. And so it would surprise people to know that one of the biggest positions that we advance, that we have not given up on, is the creation of a state rep district in West Texas that Barack Obama received 29% of the vote. Now tell me that that's about politics. We can elect a Latino Republican in West Texas in the communities of Lubbock, Midland, and Odessa that President Obama received 29% of the vote has nothing to do with politics, has everything to do with race. Uh, and so that is a big, that, that is a significant point. And when you go to these commissions, it's important to understand that how you structure it is everything. What Trey was referring to in Arizona, they created a commission and then Governor Brewer of Arizona called a special session so that she could impeach the head of the commission because she didn't think that the head of the commission was doing a good job. And guess who funds the commission? The state of Arizona. The revenues are derived up from the legislature in Arizona. So if they control the purse strings and they can control who's in and who's out, how independent is it? Uh, and Jeff Wentworth's proposal is a great idea and I've talked to people about it publicly but it says if nothing gets done by August 31st of redistricting year, then they do no more. And then you go back to where we started, which is the courts. And so I think it, the Voting Rights Act is a, no, it is a impressive piece of legislation. It should serve as, as both a sword and a shield. Uh, and states should know that what happened in a state like Texas, if it can be done in a state like a state of Texas and have no voter rights, uh, preclearance issues or litigation issues, protections from the court, then there is nothing that can be stopped uh, when it comes to states making decisions to put race aside and to expand political power on the backs of minority communities. And that's simply not uh, what we can have happen in the 21st century. Well, um, some people on the conservative side of the argument would say that's a scare tactic, mm -hmm. that you're saying if we lose the Voting Rights Act, that it would be off to the races in, this, in the sense of uh, taking away minority opportunities to, to vote. And I, and I would say that if it's a scare tactic, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, since 1970, Texas has been a covered jurisdiction since 1970. Uh, legislators in Washington, I believe Senator Benson and Barbara Jordan asked for Texas to be included in the list of covered jurisdictions. And ever since 1970, Texas has received an objection from the Department of Justice. Happened in the 70s, Democrats were in control. Happened in the 80s, Democrats were in control. Happened in the 90s, Democrats were in control. Happened in 2000, Republicans are in control. It happened in two, well, it is, it has not happened in 2010 yet. That is being litigated, but we know that the Department of Justice has issued a, an objection in their complaint, and that's currently before the District Court, before the District of Columbia. So the statistics aren't on the side of people who say it's a scare tactic. I think that, that Texas has been pretty consistent on being on the other side of the Voting Rights Act since 1970. Dr. Flores, um, we've heard uh, the accusation or being brought up, the characterization that the Democrats have a race based message and we're talking about race versus politics and is there a uh, a strategy behind uh, if, if someone wanted to limit democratic votes that they would suppress Mexican Americans from getting to 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 the ballot box to do that you know I, I've been involved in three rounds of redistricting as an as an expert witness um, and in the 1991 round, I worked for the Republican Party. And 2000, uh, 2003 round, it was, it was for uh, MALDEF. And um, this, this round, I, I worked, uh, I'm part of the reason that we're having late elections. I, I apologize to the public, but <laughs> I, was, yeah, I was one of the testifying experts in, in, in um, this, this uh, Perry v. Uh, uh, Pettis, or, or uh, Pettis v. Perry. Um, Texas redistricting round. My job is to um, identify um, 
racial intent in redistricting. I mean, how can you how can you show that race is, is the principal variable in the redistricting process that, that race is being used? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I did find working for I worked for for Maldef in these last two rounds. Maldef is nonpartisan, um, so that. The, the the chief the chief attorney will tell you and I will tell you the Maldives doesn't really care whether Republicans or Democrats get elected to office. The important thing is that Latinos get elected to office. If they're Republican Latinos, that's fine. Democratic Latinos, that's fine too. But it's Latinos. And um, one of the things that that, that I discovered uh, was that um, uh, in the areas of, of high population growth in this state is in the Latino community where the Latino community is the most dense. And there were no congressional districts drawn in those areas. Latino communities were either chopped up or packed in other areas and uh, because the, the, the redistrictors, which were Republican attorneys working for the Attorney General's office and, and, and the Texas Le um, Legislative Council, telling the Texas Legislative Council what to do, working for the Speaker's office, uh, I have copies of all their memos and emails and everything because I had to use those. That was evidence in a court law. It was very clearly that they were manipulating the Hispanic population to draw districts the way they wanted them to, to come out, which meant uh, white Republican uh, uh, politicians would get elected to office. It was very simple. It was very, very... Uh, I, I did this nice little uh, table for a judge to show that in one congressional district, 23 that had grown to um, 149,000 more population, so they had to pair out 149,000 people. The redistrictors manipulated over 600,000 people just to get the right 149,000 moved out. And the way they did it was they moved out those Latino district precincts around the periphery and the edge of the congressional district that turned out in large numbers that would not vote because they were thinking all Latinos are Democrats, so if we leave those precincts in, they're going to elect a Democrat to that congressional district. They moved them out and brought in other precincts that were low-performing Latino precincts because they knew that the white Anglo, quote-unquote, Republicans would outvote the low-performing Latinos in those precincts. Was race being used to manipulate the lines on a congressional district? Absolutely. Absolutely. Was the Republican redistrictors thinking that all Republicans are Anglos and all Latinos are Democrats? Absolutely. That's the way they were thinking. They were thinking this political party was superimposed on race, but race was really the thing that was, being, was driving the line drawing. But let me ask you, is 23rd Congressional District, that's Kiko Canseco, right? That's correct. Now he's a Latino. That's correct. And Maldef challenged that. That's correct. You said that Maldef doesn't care if they elect Republicans or Democrats as long as they're Hispanic. That's correct. So what happened there? Uh, Congressman Conseco, uh, if you look at the research on his election campaign, uh, he was elected by, by Anglo voters. The Latino voters in that congressional district didn't turn out. Elected by Americans. <laughs> well, that's true. That's very true, Mr. Okay. Rodriguez. They're all Americans to vote, whether they're Latino or Anglos. But in his case, there were Anglo-American Republican voters that came out in large amounts, thank goodness to Tea Party organizing over there. I think you all did a wonderful job. But they did not talk to the Latino community, and they didn't turn out to vote. And that's what happened. Um, matter of fact, Cito Rodriguez got, got criticized for uh, running a poor campaign and not g turning out his vote. Uh, or else he, he, he could have probably uh, uh, beat, beaten Conseco in that district. But uh, in that case, it was a very, very clear... If you look at it, Conseco was a preference of the Anglo voters, and Rodriguez was a preference of the Latino voters in that particular congressional district. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that he makes the comment that um, Maldef is, is not partisan. Um, I know some of the Maldef people personally. Now, <laughs> wait, wait, to be fair, the Tea Party, you're nonpartisan. We are nonpartisan, but we are conservative. Okay. <laughs> we are very conservative. <laughs> but we are very conservative. And the issue here is not, is not necessarily just Democrat and, it's, and Republican. It is liberal and conservative. And the issue, again, is 
that, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying in Spanish, que tratan de tapar el sol con un dedo, you try to hide the sun with, with, with your finger. The fact of the matter is, again, clearly, in Kiko Canseco's uh, example, folks, he was elected, whether it was by Anglos or Hispanics, he was elected. And what is wrong with that? What is wrong with that? I don't understand how you can punish a state for the behavior of some people 50, 60 years ago, and to keep raising that red herring, and yes, it is, it's a red herring, to keep raising it constantly because it's advantageous politically to you and economically. I mean, not only, I feel very, very strongly. I mean, I worked with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Senator Hatch back in, back in the 1980s and during the Reagan administration to get rid of affirmative action because I think that that is symptomatic of a bigger problem, that, of, of the problem that we've got, the balkanization of Americans. And it is very, very sad when you start looking at issues, well, there were, that Hispanic was not elected by, uh, by, by Hispanics, so therefore, we got a challenge. I mean, are you hearing yourselves? I, I just, I'm flabbergasted. Let's go back to the uh, participants. Yeah, Juan Gutierrez, community activist. Um, I kind of see the, the Voting Rights Act, it's almost like a checks and balance, not just for Republicans, but also for Democrats. But I have issues when you start uh, doing this grant thing that you're giving the free ID and everything, yet, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's supposed to be gone through the DPS, yet uh, soon after that, that would became one of the uh, things to, that could be done by the state or through the attorney general's office, they all of a sudden shut down 40 offices, DPS offices. And I think uh, a lot of them were in rural communities of Latino communities. And now from what I understand, there's a, a, another 40 additional uh, stations, DPS stations, fixing to be closed too. And, but now they're, uh, supposedly they're looking to see they're see what the targets are going to be. I think that's the word they use. But that seems a good reason for me to have the Voting Rights Act. Thank you. We'll pass this along. But first, I want to remind our listeners that this is the KSTX Texas Public Radio Town Hall meeting, and we're talking about the Voting Rights Act. Gil, you wanted to take that. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to get back to a, a, an earlier point. You know, I, I think we have to be careful about uh, this idea that you know, the party that is not in power, that, it, that it's, it, it's sour grapes and that their message hasn't been effective. And I'm not to, not to suggest that this does not happen at times. But I think if you look back historically, you know, in the mid-1960s in Texas, 180 of the 181 people in the state legislature were Democrats. Now, if you had said uh, to the Republicans at that time, you know, nobody likes your message. Uh, it's just, it's not getting through, so just, you just got to deal with it. And, uh, you know, that's the, the fault is, is with you. Well, it wasn't as simple as that, because we had um, uh, at, uh, at large districts in this state, uh, and the system was set up to make it difficult for Republicans to get elected. And the Voting Rights Act actually, uh, initially, was, was very beneficial to the Republican Party for, for quite a long time. And Tr Trey was pointing out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, you know, that when Democrats were in power, uh, it actually it was a, a safeguard for the Republican Party in a sense. So, I th I think that we have to look at the situation as as not simply you know this one party is is their message is failing and and that's that's what it's all about because the system can be set up and and it was the, the, it was actually set up in a way to prevent Republicans from having power for a long time in the state. David, if I, if, if I could just to uh, the point about the closing mm -hmm. of the 40 DPS offices. It, it, what that means is that Texas still has more driver's license offices than any other state. I mean, Texas is a very large. Proportionally, I mean, Texas is a very large state, and and obviously we face some some budgetary challenges. Those offices, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody in the legislature thought, well, we're closing these offices with the intent of keeping people from being able to vote. Um, and so again, I, I, I think it's 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 this it's this colorization of emotion over the common sense aspects of of what we have here and to the point earlier about um, you know the exchange of emails I think that's directly on point with what I said earlier it forces people in the legislature particularly section 5 of the Voting Rights Act forces the legislature to look at race first 
uh, and to look at, at, at where and how we're going to effectuate race. And it's this, again, this politicization of the act that takes place. I mean, when you have the, the U.S. Justice Department objecting to Kinston, North Carolina, moving from uh, partisan city council elections to nonpartisan, the citizens uh, of, of the city voted and said, we want to go to nonpartisan elections. And the Justice Department entered an objection and said, wait, 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 you can't do that. How are we going to be able to identify who the Republicans and Democrats are? And they objected. So Kinston goes and they, they file suit in the, in the district court in District of Columbia. And all of a sudden the Justice Department decides, well, maybe we'll reconsider that and that's fine. Well, the reason why they did that is because they knew that they were putting Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act on the fast track to be struck down as unconstitutional. Because you can't say that when the citizens of a community decide they want to have nonpartisan elections, and you can't say, well, you can't identify who the Republican and Democrat is, that you're not actually politicizing uh, the Voting Rights Act. And more importantly, when we look at the voting, I mean, the real problem with the Voting Rights Act and what we've talked about here tonight is really Section 5. It's the preclearance requirement. It's whether or not the state of Texas and really only a few states, not all states, a few states, have to go get permission from the federal government to take action. Now, if, every, if, if it was an application to all states, that may change the nature of what this debate is, but it's not. But Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which really does protect minority communities and gives them an opportunity to go to court and to challenge actions that are truly egregious. Uh, you know, uh, we haven't heard any discussion of Section 2, but because Section 2 works just fine. It's Section 5 that's become the political tool. Mr. Trainer, thank you very much for that. And uh, Mr. Martinez. Just 30 seconds. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of inside baseball in redistricting. And, and what Dr. Flores was referring to when he said these emails, there was evidence uh, that was emails exchanged uh, by folks who were drawing these lines. Uh, and when Trey says, well, you know, you can tell from these emails that people are looking at race, well, I want to be clear, these emails were looking at race. They weren't looking at using race to protect minorities. They were looking at race to destroy communities. And you will see email after email to say, well, what do we need to do in this area that we can give the illusion of a Hispanic majority seat, but we know because we can look at election data that these minorities are not voting. And so on the surface, it looks like it's a 50% plus Hispanic district, but we know it really isn't because they don't vote. And so the minorities will never have the opportunity if they even came together on their best day, they wouldn't elect a candidate of their choice. I wanna be very, very clear about that. And there are, there are, there are dozens of emails uh, that speak to that. And, and, and secondly, I, I don't think anyone thought, including the Colonel of the Department of Public Safety, that he was gonna be in the business of issuing IDs for people to go out and vote. We know that we could do this with same day registration right at the <coughs> precinct poll as it takes place. If you have a good ID and if all you need, that's all you need to vote, well then why can't we use that to register people same day and let them vote in the primary in the general election? The fact of the matter is I want my state troopers out there defending our states and protecting us from drug dealers and drug traffickers and human traffickers and all the bad things that they ought to be protecting us from, not going around putting people behind a desk to make you prove who you are in order for you to vote in your general or your primary election. I think we have our priorities backwards, and I think the department will be the first one to tell you that. They are not equipped to handle what's to come with voter ID, uh, and they'd rather have someone else do it. And that's why we said, let's be commonsensical, like Trey suggested. Let's exempt the military. Let's exempt veterans. Let's exempt seniors that have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, let's let the county decide if this is the best direction for a county to go. Let's have local control. That is a big talking point in lots of political circles to have local control. Let the local county decide if this is something that they want to do in their county. Let's give them that control, that choice. All those things rejected. This wasn't about coming up with a common sense solution. This was about how are we going to make something very difficult and we're going to pass it and we're just going to stick together and we'll vote it down 99 to 45 you know, every time there's an amendment. And that's exactly what happened. Let's go back to the floor. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm obliged to speak just because there's no women on your panel tonight. Uh, my name is Tanya Aguilar Garduño, and I'm here as an individual, not as um, pertaining to any political party, um, just from community. Um, and I just wanted to know the, um, I guess my question is about the guidelines that the Supreme Court issued uh, to our three judge panels here in Texas, and how, what do you all feel that um, basically 
I guess, how it redefines um, the continuation of the Voting Rights Act in terms of coalition districts. You want to take that? Mr. Flood? I'm, I'm happy to. Okay, Mr. Uh, Trainer. I think I think they were very clear uh, that the that this concept of coalition districts, this concept that that's been attempted to be litigated by, uh, it was you know it was attempted in Lulac versus Perry, and again it's been attempted here in the Perez litigation. It's been t attempted uh, in several other pieces of litigation that you can put these coalitions of minorities together, and somehow or another they're protected. Um, the the jurisprudence of the Voting Rights Act makes it very clear that you have to have a majority of a particular uh, minority group uh, in place. And, and, I, and I think the, the Perry versus Perez decision uh, mentions that specifically, that this, uh, you know, if the court there was attempting to create a coalition district, uh, one, it can't do it, and two, it didn't have any justification if that's what they were trying to do. And they mentioned that specifically with regard to the initial Congressional District 33 that was drawn. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, th I think we're coming to the end of uh, this attempt to create coalition districts, uh, and, we, and we're now moving more towards the, the traditional uh, going through the, the various factors of, uh, there's some case laws, it's called the jingles factors as to whether or not there's cohesive voting among a minority community and whether they're compact enough uh, to constitute being created into a district. So. I think, I, I think what w at the end of this litigation, I think what we'll see is a very firm determination that coalition districts don't have to be drawn and aren't a necessity uh, for, a, uh, for a covered jurisdiction. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is um, Kamala Platt. Usually when I get up to ask a question, it's because I'm, I'm like really inspired about something wonderful that I feel like is happening. But today, I'm confused. And I guess the confusion, maybe you can help me out. Um, I came because I saw the, I heard on the radio, this is gonna be about the Voting Rights Act. And, um, and that's a federal, as my understanding, I'm not a legal scholar, but my understanding is that that's a federal um, act that, that we as states um, participate under. And what I'm hearing is people from a t particular state who for whatever reasons are calling it things like red herring and unconstitutional without having legitimate reasons for doing that. And I feel like, you know, I, I have family and extended family that marched for that, that, that suffered and were in prison and, and you know, I know people that lost their lives in this struggle to have this and make this a better country. And I don't understand why, I mean, how we can have, um, I'm not saying that, you know, everyone has the right to say and feel whatever they, they like, but I don't feel like, I mean, this is, I trusted the public radio station, I trust Trinity University, I don't feel like this is up to our standards for what um, we should be discussing in terms of this. It is a difficult issue in terms of the redistricting and all of that, but I'd like to ask if we can somehow raise the level of the discussion and, and really bring it up to what the Voting Rights Act demands of us. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Flutus. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, you know. As you saw from the program, I've testified in a lot of different cases, and one of the things I've told the lawyers over the years is that what's missing in these cases, and what's very, very sad about these cases, is that the human stories of the sacrifice and the pain that people who, who have had injustices brought against them uh, because that have given rise to these lawsuits uh, don't get into the court record. These trials boil down to a bunch of technicians and academics and statisticians talking about all kinds of line drawing and software packages, this, that, and the other. But they don't talk about, um, for instance, uh, they don't talk about um, the, uh, the beatings that go on in some rural communities because uh, a Latino boy decided to, to, to date an Anglo girl and his brothers found out about it and they dragged him out and so forth because, but, but that's one line drawn in that community that you can't not cross. That's part of the evidence that I testified to. I dig up stuff like that and I present it in the courtroom. 
but the people involved, uh, the, 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 I've, I've worked in Philadelphia and Mississippi, and those of you who are old enough to understand the history of the Voting Rights Act and know the name of that town, know what a horrible nightmare and secret those people uh, have to live with. Um, the, 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 the psychology in that community, the environment in that community is so depressive to this day. They've got a collective guilty conscience for the murders that occurred in that community because of the Voting Rights Act. And those stories just don't make it into, 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 into the trials. Instead, it's a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of suits and a bunch of PhDs talking about stuff that don't count. And, and this, this woman, I, 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 did, I missed her name, it's very true. We need to raise this, this discussion to a higher level. This is a law that protects the constitutional right of a group of people or groups of people who have been denied the right to participate in a democracy. Been denied, denied the right to participate in a democracy because of their color or the language that they speak. These laws, Section 5, is a, is a law that forces the state to obey the Constitution of the United States. Fundamentally, period, that's it. That's really what we need to be talking about. But we do get bogged down in technicalities. But anyway, I just needed to make that statement, David. And I do want to point out that we did begin the discussion uh, by you know, bringing up and hearing the, what happened at the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, outside of Selma and trying to draw a, a big, bold line back to uh, that event and showing that this is about people um, it's not just about abstract numbers. M Mr. Trainer, you, you wanted to weigh in. Sure. Uh, you know, I think what, 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 what Dr. Flores has pointed out is that a, a court of law, justice can be blind a lot of times. Uh, in fact, we want it to be. Uh, Section 5 is a complete distortion of, of the regular course of business uh, in a lawsuit. It requires the state to prove that you weren't racist in what you did. It's not that evidence is put on that you did do something that's wrong. It's that you have to go in and prove that you didn't do something wrong. Uh, and so it completely changes the course of our jurisprudence uh, and, how, and how we've always faced legal cases in, the, in this country. Uh, and, and that's what happens there. And, and yes, I, I will admit that there are a lot of times that personal stories you know, I mean, when you're dealing with the entire state of Texas, 254 counties, the millions of people in the population moves in the very short period of time. We could address issues, we could address all the individual issues that we wanted if we didn't have to have a primary election uh, in May. You know, we, we could spend hours upon hours hearing testimony of folks. Uh, but you can't do that. At, at, some point you, at some point, you have to get down to uh, the, the, what the districts are going to look like where people are going to go vote. Um, you know, we're all, as an attorney, I'm always thankful to have people like Dr. Flores to come and testify and to speak to various issues that we need uh, expert testimony on. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've got to get down and you've got to have the elections. Let's go back to the floor. Yes, sir. My name is Raphael Williams. <clears throat> I am a citizen of the east side of San Antonio, Texas. And I am amazed at the framing of this debate in terms of conservative and liberal and Democrat and Republican. I'm amazed that a conservative would use and always does use Dr. Martin Luther King as a platform to discriminate against the very people that he supported. I'm amazed that they would be constitutionalist when the Constitution was not built for women or minorities, or people of color. And that you say that it's a red herring. You say that there's no need um, to discuss race because we're in the post-Obama racial, racialist society. But if what Dr. Flores says is that three out of the four million people who grew here in the state of Texas should not equate out to three out of four districts being represented by the people who are responsible for that growth. Explain to me how you think that that's not fair and explain to me how you think that there is no history currently when the biggest, the biggest stories of the news of the past week are of a sexist man saying something about women and 
an institution, a status quo, a, a, a conservative status quo institution not recognizing or acting on the beating and kill, I'm sorry, the killing, the murder of a young man. That's the reason why there is a Voting Rights Act. How do you not see that that's the reason for there not being a Voting Rights Act? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Rodriguez, you want to take that? <clears throat> First of all, let me, let me say that um, I am not saying that there is no racism. Racism and adultery and murder, all of those things are around. This young lady that spoke a little while ago about legitimate reasons, let me tell you that when I registered at Highland Park Elementary in 1955, uh, my first year, my mother registered me. Um, and I was one of five uh, or six Hispanic kids to enter that, uh, that school. And I remember the racism. So you can't tell me that there's no legitimate reason that I can speak because I do have, I feel I have very legitimate background on, on, on this issue. The issue, my friends, is that it's how this law is being applied. It's my understanding from my readings and my listening to, uh, to speeches by Dr. King that he wanted a race neutral. He did not want a situation where race was taken into consideration. That's what he was fighting. And it seems to me like this is exactly what, that is exactly the, the exact reverse of what has happened. I mean, just as was classically said a little while ago, Conseco apparently is not Hispanic enough. You know, I don't know what, you know, it, it means to have resegregation of Hispanic districts so that we can have Hispanic districts, have resegregation of, uh, or continued segregation of uh, black districts so that they, there can be a, a black representative. I mean, that, that just seems to fly in the face. Instead of having an integrated society, instead of having or promoting a, a, a political diversity, uh, it seems like we just, uh, like, like the opposite is happening. So, uh, yes, you know, I do believe that there's still racism, but I also believe that there's also still murder. I still, I believe that there, you have to have laws against uh, all of those things, but I also believe that these are moral questions as well as legal questions. And I believe in the Constitution just the way that it was written, because within the Constitution there are laws that uh, there is a way by which the change can be accomplished without getting into the streets, without um, uh, any type of violent protest. There is a way to do it. And I think that that is the, beauti the beauty of our country. And those that want to change the law can do it. And it's that simple. I am a proud conservative Hispanic. And I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry for you. OK, yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Caitlin Earhart, and I'm a senior in high school. But I just want to, y'all were talking about, and the whole premise of this is getting rid of the um, writing the Voting Rights Act. And so I was wondering if, in getting rid of it, if we're just getting rid of the section five, the whole idea of getting rid of it. Is it just the section five that's more debatable, or is it the entire thing, like you said, section two, that was actually like proven? Mr. Trainer, I, I think section five is the most egregious portion of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And just to put it in, in practical terms, if Texas and all the other southern states were required to pay 25% more of their income taxes than every other state, we would all, we would all think that was egregious. And that's what Section 5 says, is that these states, these states in the southern part of the United States, some Indian reservations out west, some communities uh, in uh, so a couple of the boroughs in New York, you're being, signaled, you're being singled out and applied to you the law differently than the rest of the country. Uh, and I, I think that applies to the Voting Rights Act. I mean, it applies to the, to the voter ID question as well. I mean, that's why uh, the Georgia voter ID question is so important for the state of Texas is because it's a Section 5 covered jurisdiction. So I think when we talk about the most troubling part 
uh, of the Voting Rights Act. It is Section 5, and again, it's, it's the one that reverses the roles when we go to court where you have to prove that you're not being racist. Um, whereas Section 2, you bring a normal lawsuit saying, I, you know, my, my rights have been violated. And again, do we really need that? I, I don't know that we do. There's already federal law that covers that anyways. And, it, you know, 42 U.S.C. 1983 covers uh, the state acting against someone's civil rights anyways, uh, whether it be the, th the 13th, 14th, or 15th Amendment. Uh, and it applies to the states. Uh, and so, you know, th there are other laws out there that have been around a lot longer than the Voting Rights Act has that, that can be used to do the same thing. So there are problems with other parts of the Voting Rights Act, but Section 5 is the most egregious. So we would get rid of all of it? That's just what I'm asking. In trying to get would the Supreme it? Court likely just strike out Section 5? Well, and, you know, gi given the way that the Supreme Court addresses constitutional questions, I think, I think that they would start with Section 5. Uh, and, and they've been presented that opportunity a couple of times. So, you know, the, the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District challenged Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and instead of dealing with the constitutional question, they went to a different part of the Voting Rights Act and said, well, you have the opportunity to bail out, and we're going to let you avail yourself of that. So, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, it's, it's a weighty topic when they decide the constitutionality of, of a hard-fought piece of legislation like the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and so I think they will take a minimalist approach and say, well, we're, if, if Section 5 is what's being challenged, and that's what is being challenged uh, both out of Tennessee uh, and out of the state of Texas right now, so I think that's probably going to be the first step. Um, now, could that ultimately lead to Section 2 being challenged down the road? Possibly. But, uh, you know, right now the near term is Section 5. And, Dr. Flores, what would Texas look like if Section 5 is struck? Uh, um, well, let's see, I wrote a long list of things that it looked like before Section 5 existed, including uh, poll taxes and arbitrarily changing polling places. Section 5, though, is the enforcement section. So it, it forces the jurisdiction to follow the law. Section 2 allows someone to sue a jurisdiction because they suspect that a violation of the law has occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the difference between the two is that in sec Section 5 is an automatic trigger. The jurisdiction has to go to the Department of Justice for preclearance to show that they're obeying the law or they're in violation of the law. Section 2 requires that one of you citizens out there decide there's a violation of a, of a voting rights law and then find an attorney that can really argue your case well, come up with the money to go to court and take the whole thing. That's the difference. For them to say that Section 5 is the most egregious, Section five, if Section 5 were to be overturned, it would gut the entire Voting Rights Act. It, w it really would. So that, that, that's what's, the Supreme Court wouldn't have to strike the rest of it down. Section 5 would just kill the whole thing. Well, we're, we're running out of time here, uh, but Representative, um, not Representative, but Mr. Rodriguez, you wanted to comment. Thank you. Um, when, when you're looking at, again, looking at this law, you got to remember, okay, if somebody has committed something wrong, punish that individual. Do not punish an entire state, and certainly don't punish an entire society. That is ridiculous. You've got, if somebody has done something wrong, punish that individual. So, but, but how is this punishment? It seems like what it is is a corrective measure that may take a span of time because, you, you know, we've had decades of centuries of, uh, of discrimination and prejudice. Enforcement is, in my, in my book, in my interpretation, interpret, uh, uh, enforcement is, uh, is a form of punishment because, again... So that ensuring that we have fair elections is a but form we're not of punishment. Doing that. We are not doing that with Illinois. We're not doing that with, with Ohio. We're doing it with Texas. We're selecting a state. Uh, we're selecting a group of states uh, that... You know, I mean, it just, we're, well, and, we're just and, and, zeroing in on I, that. I hear, I hear the audience talking about based upon history. And, you know, when, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, it didn't apply to the state of Texas. Texas, yeah, uh, right. Texas didn't have the Voting Rights Act applied right. to it until 1973. And the only reason that Texas had the Voting Rights Act applied to it was because of, of language barriers. Exactly. And requiring Texas to print ballots in both Spanish and English. And requiring Texas to print polling locations in both Spanish and English, it had nothing to do with the fact that Texas had uh, the. D I mean, the the whole the whole start of the act is revolves around whether or not there's a test or a tax in place to cover a jurisdiction. It didn't apply to Texas because of that. We weren't keeping people from voting, 
It's that, it's that uh, there, there, were, there were language barriers that had been corrected. And I don't think anybody thinks that if Section 5 goes away, that the state of Texas is going to stop printing ballots in both Spanish and English. Or in Harris County, that they'll continue to print them in the various forms of Chinese dialects that they have to print them in. Because, you know, it, it, we, we've moved beyond that, and, and it's, not, it's not Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that's keeping Texas to continuing to do that. Gil Garcia. Well, you know, and it's true about Texas. And I think there was politics initially. You know, Lyndon Johnson was president, and I, I think he was reluctant to have Texas included in that. But you know, I, I think I think egregious is a is a word that to, I, I have a lot of trouble applying that to Section Five. It's it's an extreme measure, and the people who who supported it initially would say it was an extreme measure, but it was an extreme measure because the situation was extreme, and as we I mentioned earlier, the state of Mississippi had seven percent African American voter registration in 1965. It's absurd. And to see Alabama going from 19 to 52% in two years, Mississippi going from 7 to 60%, this is miraculous. So we can, I, I, as I said earlier, I think it's fair to discuss how long uh, Section 5 will be in place, whether it should be permanent, whether there is, whether there is uh, at, at some point, whether it's no longer necessary. But I would really strongly disagree with the idea that that this uh, measure was has not been a positive uh, part of the election process, and that it hasn't had a miraculous effect uh, in, in the United States. And the last word will be going to Representative Trey Martinez Fisher. Thank you, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> when Texas first became a covered jurisdiction under the Voting Rights Act in 1970 or 1973, as Trey had mentioned, there was a case called White versus Register. And it's it's really just so, sort of serendipity because we're fighting redistricting today in 2011, 2012, and we're doing it in San Antonio, which has been the birthplace of a lot of civil and social justice movements. Well, White v. Registered involved San Antonio in the 1970s, and it dealt with drawing single-member districts in both Dallas and in Bear County so that minorities would have the opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. And that's one of the first things that happened in the 1970s, and frankly, it's still happening today. In 2001, when the legislature drew a map or failed to draw a map, there is a group called the Legislative Redistricting Board. They drew a map. And lo and behold, the Department of Justice under President Bush, George W. Bush, objected. And when that objection came out, Attorney General Cornyn, who's now a United States Senator, guess what he said? He said, well, they only objected to four districts in the State House. I am very proud to say that at least 98% of the map met these requirements of the Voting Rights Act, and we'll happily fix those districts. Ten years later, the Obama Department of Justice says there's a problem with the Texas map, and now it's, we must get rid of Section 5 because it's not working. What has happened in ten years that we now feel like we have to throw out the baby and the bathwater? And I will say that nobody uh, has mentioned that when the state of Texas decided to sue the United States, uh, which we read very recently, uh, Texas here lately is number one. We're finally first in something. We're first in suing the federal government uh, more times than any other state. Uh, this wasn't done. Section 5 wasn't challenged in redistricting. They had the opportunity to challenge the constitutionality of Section 5 in redistricting, so perhaps Attorney General Abbott thinks we still need Section 5 for redistricting. He didn't challenge it there. He threatened to challenge it in voter ID when he said, feds, you approve this law or else we might just have to question the constitutionality of Section 5 now that we know that they have moved forward. Uh, but another state has been way out of the gate on this already. Uh, and so perhaps if it was easy to get into the Voting Rights Act by having lawmakers say, put my state in that jurisdiction, we represent the will of the people, that's how we got to Congress and the Senate, perhaps we should let them take us out that way. Let's do it legislatively. Why do we have to do it through the courts? No one's done that in the state of Texas. I haven't seen Senator Cornyn, Senator Hutchinson. I haven't seen anybody do that. And so if we're going to do this, let's look at it where the state of Texas puts its priorities. You know, perhaps this is a fair discussion for voter ID. It's pretty clear from the litigation and redistricting that the Attorney General seems to think that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is working just fine. Uh, and we've settled a case in large part temporarily based on uh, the offerings of the Attorney General operate on behalf of the state of Texas. So it does work as a sword and a shield, as it should. 
All right, well, thank you very much. That wraps up the Texas Public Radio Town Hall meeting on the Voting Rights Act. I do want to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Henry Flores, a professor of political science at St. Mary's University, Trey Trainer, an Austin-based attorney specializing in election law and government relations, Representative Trey Martinez-Fisher, he uh, represents District 116, the San Antonio Democrat, George Rodriguez, the president of the San Antonio Tea Party, Gil Garcia, political reporter with Plaza de Armas, and the author of the recently published book, Reagan's Comeback. Also, a uh, thanks to NowCastSA.com for carrying this program live. If you're listening to us on the uh, radio, you can also go to NowCastSA.com and check out the video there. Also, thanks to our audience participants. Thank you for coming out this evening and uh, voicing your support and taking part in the democratic process. After all, that is what the Voting Rights Act is all about. I'm David Martin Davies. Have a good night.